Okay, so um, I'm actually not going to be talking so much about the product, though of course there is an element of the product pitch as well. Uh, but I'll be talking more about about how to handle uh, errors in JavaScript in general. You know, people hate product pitches. I would hate to sit for a product pitch. Uh, so I'll try to dress it up as something that's interesting for everybody. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about how to handle uh, errors in JavaScript. Uh, but before that, uh, my name is Rakesh Pai uh, at rakeshpai.me. Uh, my Twitter handle is rakesh314. Uh, and I'm sort of like a hipster, right? I've been doing JavaScript before it was cool, um, but <laughs> but that's that's how it is, right? Um, I'll very quickly rush through the purpose of catching errors, um, uh, but I'm sure everyone knows why it is important to know to catch errors. Uh, JavaScript is very different from other programming languages. Uh, JavaScript, so you know, if you're, if you're coding in you know I don't know PHP or, or, or Ruby on Rails or whatever. You can you can freaking compile the OS the way you want it, right? With right with the right thing. In JavaScript, you don't have that. You don't have that luxury. Your your code is running in the wild. Uh, it's running on environments that you have no control over, in operating systems and, and, and setups that that you have absolutely you cannot predict beforehand. So JavaScript is very different from other environments. Uh, there is there is this uh, I would call it the three-dimensional grid of possibilities, right? There is the Operating systems, there's the browsers and the browser versions, right? So it's a three-dimensional grid within which anywhere your errors can occur, and and you uh, you have absolutely no control over this. Uh, errors when they happen are logged to your end user's console. Uh, so so when errors occur, they are logged to your end user's console. Which is absolutely uh, useless to you as a, uh, as a programmer because those errors are essentially lost. You don't find out about such errors, right? And uh, uh, when errors occur, your users are not going to complain to you. You know, your users are going to leave your site because your computer websites are, are working. Your sites are not. Uh, you know, they are not. They are not going to. You know, it's it's not a nice world where people are going to file a bug report, go find where your bug report is. That's not how it works, right? Uh, so, so that's so. It's important to find out what's going wrong with your website, and uh, and hence uh, it's important to catch errors. Um, the best case scenario is, let's say, your ad network or something like that breaks down, and you get this little, you know, done but with errors on the page, and your code still continues to work. Right? That's the best case scenario. Uh, but you know, in, in the worst case scenario, uh, your app blows up. Right? Um, so, so yeah. So when JavaScript fails. Uh, it takes down everything, <laughs> uh, and you don't want to be in that situation. Um, right. So, uh, I'm going to go over a, a, a bunch of, of mechanisms of catching these errors. Uh, mind you, there are two parts to this. One is catching errors, and the second is reporting the error. To some service uh, so that so that you can do fancy stuff with it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about reporting the reporting bit or the posting of the error bit so much. That's rather trivial. You figure out a mechanism by which you can post that error. That you know, simple. Uh, the difficult bit is how do you catch the error? That's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, because because we are you know of the computer science fraternity and all that, uh, we have to we have to act like we are all very scientific, you know, methodical, come up with you know little charts and the grading system and all that. So we're going to do a little bit of that as well, right? Uh, so I'm going to establish a bunch of criteria. Uh, these these criteria. This is my opinion about how uh, about how uh, you know, about what you should be looking for in an error reporting system. Uh, your opinions might be different, and that's fine. But these are, these are my opinions, right? Uh, performance is very important to me. I do not want to compromise on performance either at runtime or at load time. Runtime performance is a lesser of a concern because our engines are getting so fast. But but load time performance is very very important. On no account should there be a load time hit at all. Um, your uh, I could have you know I spoke about this in the last talk as well. I could have probably changed. I could have called it something else. By reliability, what I essentially mean is that you should not be taking a hard dependency on the system. So in case the system for whatever reason breaks down. Your app still continues to work, and to me, I'm calling that reliability. I don't have a better word for it, but if you have, please let me know. Uh, but that's what I'm calling reliability here. That you don't take a hard dependency on the system, right? Um, the implementation effort should be little. If if the implementation effort, the ongoing implementation effort is very high to keep working with an error reporting system, 
uh, you're going to stop working towards making the error reporting system work eventually. So, uh, you know, implementation effort has to be as low as possible. Uh, these three things to me are the most important things uh, when, I'm, when I'm trying to consider which error reporting system to use. Uh, if there's going to be a compromise either on performance, if it, if it requires that I'm going to take a heavy dependency on the system, or if there's a, going to be a lot of ongoing effort for me to continue implementing it, uh, I'm going to throw such a system away because it does not work, right? If, if any one of the systems come across, uh, have these characteristics, I'm going to throw them away. Other than this, there are a bunch of other good to haves. Uh, and that is that I should be able to, if I can get rich details about the error, things like stack traces, you know, all of that kind of stuff, then that would be awesome. Uh, if it has got a hundred percent coverage, if all of my errors are covered by by by, this, by the error reporting system, that's awesome. So, for example, um, if you have an ahref on click equal to something, right? Is that going to be caught by the error reporting system? If it can, great. You know, if it can't, and if it only does, uh, uh, you know, external JavaScript, that's not too bad either. So, you know, coverage coverage is is, is one of the factors. Uh, simplicity, of course, I, I I like simplicity a lot, and there's there's great value to simplicity. Uh, so, you know, if, if a system is simple, it obviously becomes better. Uh, and browser support goes without saying, we're talking about client-side errors, so, you know, decent browser support is necessary. Um, so, we're going to come up with a scorecard, you know, like I said, we have to look scientific. So, uh, that's the top three, performance, reliability, and effort. Uh, and I've put, you know, stars next to them because I could not find any other Unicode symbol. But, uh, you know, these are the three most important things that, that I, I would care about. And these are, you know, other things that, that I would create systems against as well. So, so let's get started. There are about six or seven mechanisms, and we'll race through all of them. It's you know, it's hopefully not too much uh, to take in. Uh, so, so the first mechanism is to add try catch blocks manually to your code, right? It's beautiful. Who likes to add try catch blocks to their code? <laughs> if anybody here is familiar with, with astrophysics, there's a term called spaghettification, right? It's, it's uh, uh, when there's a black hole, and then there's the event horizon of a black hole, and a like matter enters through the event horizon. Uh, it gets there are opposing gravity forces on it. It gets extruded and it gets stretched and broken into little pieces. And you know, until it's a stream of atoms that's flowing. So I show you how try catch blocks work like that, right? Uh, so so let's take this case of of a very simple function uh, where what it does is it waits for page load to be ready, and then when a button click happens, it's going to alert the next sequential number in in a series, right? So a uh, simple piece of code. Now let's say that I want to add try catch blocks to this. Any guesses about how this will work? Uh, turns out, this is how it turns out, right? Because, because of the nature of JavaScript. Uh, when I have done, when I have defined this one function, the outermost function, this stack is now is thrown away because the execution of this assignment is done, right? At some point in the future, the inner function is going to execute. That's going to have its own stack. Right? And so now I will have to have the outer try catch is not going to apply because the outer try catch stack has already unrolled, it's gone. Right? So now my inner code has to have its own try catch, which is over here. So I've got the outer try catch, then my inner try catch. Then of course the button click happens at some unspecified time in the future, that will require its own try catch. Right? So so there are there are I mean looking at this trivially, it's hard to say where all I will need to add try catch blocks. Now these functions here are asynchronous functions. If the functions were synchronous functions, then I don't need try catch because the auto try catch will work because it's in the same call stack, right? Uh, but since they are async functions, I will need to have uh, try catch blocks around each of those async functions. Uh, I'm hiding away this detail in post server. I'll come to that in a second. But uh, but you can see how how complex it gets very quickly. Yeah, it's horrid. I, I don't want. If I was supposed to sit down and do this, dude, I'm not going to do it. Like seriously, this is this painful, right? Um, so so let's look at the scorecard. I'll come to performance in a second. Reliability is great because you are not taking a hard, there's no system, so to say, to take a hard dependency on. So, reliability is great. Uh, effort is not low at all. So, I'm, I'm, I'm counting out effort. And really, because I said that the top three is what matters, I've got a negative over here, already I can throw the system away. But for completeness, uh, there is, I get rich errors. So, each time you get an error object, right, which is what we were getting last time, if you, if, and there are cross browser concerns and all of that, but keeping all of that complications aside, generally, if you get an error object, there is there's a great deal of data that you can get out from that. So 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 yeah, so rich errors are possible thanks to that. Uh, I'm gonna say coverage is bad because because your coverage is manual. You have to remember to add try catch blocks everywhere. So I'm gonna generally say that coverage is bad unless you are diligent enough to make sure that everything has been covered. Uh, 
It's simple, you know, it's not, it's not too complicated a system. The code is complex, but the, it's, it's not easy, to, it's not complicated to reason with the system, so the system is really simple. Uh, and browser support is great. Browser support is everywhere that try cache blocks are supported. And try cache blocks have been supported for donkey's years in, in JavaScript. Right? So, so that's good. I said I'll come back to performance. Performance depends because um, right here I've defined the post error function. I'm, I'm assuming that the post error function is available. Um, now this this post error function is basically going to take the job or going to do the job of collecting the error object and then posting that to a server somehow. Uh, those details apart, uh, the fact is that the, the function has to be defined for you to use beforehand. Um, and there are there are several ways in which you can make this function available within the scope of the of within the execution scope. Uh, one is of course that you include a script tag that is going to have that's going to define the post error function. Right, simple enough. Uh, the problem is that, that is now going to add uh, a network request to your page, uh, and hence your page load is going to slow down by that much bit because now you're going over the network to fetch a file. Uh, so that's going to slow down. So that's going to make your performance deteriorate a bit. Why does this keep happening? Any idea? <laughs> Unplug and replug seems to be working. <laughs> How do you try turning it off and on again? <laughs> So, um, so another way to make another way to so so you know external requests are not a good idea. Uh, let's say that you decide to inline the code into your uh, into your uh, HTML itself so that there's no network request that's going out. Now this could be problematic depending on how big the uh, the post error function itself is. If it's too big, inlining it is not a good idea. Uh, and you know if if you do inline it anyway, you will have this on several pages. How do you manage any changes that might happen to it and so on? So. You know, it depends on which approach you take. It could be either fast or slow. We'll come back and address this towards the end of the talk. But for now, uh, let's just say that performance depends on which approach you take. Right? Uh, now, there are, uh, if, since manually adding try cache blocks is such a pain, you could consider adding them automatically. And there are, there are a couple of ways in which that can be done. Uh, there is a way in which, so, so let's say that you can have a build script, right? That is going to do this for you. Uh, the way it will work is that, during build time, it will look at your JavaScript code, load that into an AST generator, uh, look at the syntax tree now, and within that syntax tree, find out which are the function calls, and to those function calls, append try catch blocks to them, right? It's possible to do this. It's painful, but it's possible to do this. Um, it's, it's fairly complex. The build system is complex. Of course, once your build system is, is ready, uh, using it is rather simple. You just write code as usual, and then your build script takes care of it, right? But building the build system is fairly complex. Uh, it will require static analysis of the code. If you're scared scared of looking at things like ASTs, then this is not for you. Um, and it can introduce its own bugs, of course, because because you're dealing with JavaScript at that level now. Um, so performance again depends for the same reason because post error has to be available somehow. Uh, but that said, reliability is great because you are not having. Uh, at runtime, at least, you're not having a dependency on an external system. You know, your build script will either work or fail, uh, and that does not affect your site itself, right? So, so reliability is great. Uh, effort is low because you just continue writing code as normal. Of course, there is the one-time effort of creating the build script itself, which uh, which I'm not counting over here uh, uh, because that's a one-time effort. So it's not an ongoing effort. So I'm going to count that out. Uh, errors are great. Coverage is mostly great, uh, and I'll come to what I mean by mostly. Uh, it's not a simple system because you are you are writing code in one place and what you are ending up shipping to the user is another thing altogether. So you know it's it, there's no sort of it's hard to map that one to one. So, so simplicity is not really clean. Uh, browser support again is great because it's just using try cache blocks after all. Uh, coverage is good mostly because uh, you cannot cover inline code at all with this, right? So unless you're thinking about passing your HTML uh, to uh, AST generator by looking at your HTML's uh, script tags and so on is just painful, right? Uh, so coverage is only just mostly good, uh, but that's 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 not bad at all. Now, now out of the three that I mentioned, uh, you can make performance good. So you've got the remaining two green there, which is one of the best methods, really. You know, of all the methods that I'm going to discuss, this is one of the best methods. Uh, I recommend that if you are really serious about catching your errors, consider this. Of course, it's not for the faint of heart because you have to build your own. Uh, AST parser, but but uh, uh, this is this is not uh, this is this is one of the best methods out there, right? Let's move on quickly. Excuse me. Any known example of how you take this? Uh, these these are internal tools, so uh, you know 
the bench clip being an internal tool, it depends on uh, the company to company. I, I don't know any example that's using this. Right? But, but we come to variants of that very quickly, and so we find out. Uh, there, are, there are mechanisms by which you can, so there are services that are available, right? You, you not believe this, the kind of services that are available, man, it's crazy. There are services that are available to which you can give them your JavaScript file, and they will give you a file that has got try catch blocks in it. Who would have thought that people would get services? <laughs> but, but there are services that are available that do this. So what you do is that you, instead of including um, uh, your JavaScript file directly from your web server, you include JavaScript file from their proxy instead. What, what happens is that your script source is pointing to their proxy. Their proxy will then in turn make a request to your web server, pick up your file, add try catch blocks to your code, and then shout down the try cached code uh, to your client, right? So that gives you uh, uh, try cache code into the client, right? Uh, so that's that's awesome. Um, you end up you do end up taking a heavy dependency on the proxy. What if the proxy goes down? Uh, you know that's 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 a solid concern that you have to be worried about. Um, you know, and instead of doing some bugs because you're still looking at ASD, but this is, this is the lesser of a concern because we're going to say that these guys know what they're doing. They're the guys who ship the proxy, so they know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, you do end up taking a heavy dependency on the proxy. So the score part here looks like this. Performance still depends for the same reason. Uh, reliability has gone down obviously because you are uh, your code, your the how how well how quickly your code will or even the very running of your code is dependent on on their proxy. Uh, everything else is mostly fine. It's still not a simple system, but it's mostly fine. But but you know a big red over there. Uh, we don't want that. Um, so a new service uh, launched by or by combinator funding and all that. That's awesome. Uh, that does something very similar. Um, where what they have is that you know they try to mitigate the problem of the reliability issue that we had the last time. And you know they say that in case the proxy is down, what we will do is we will reroute the traffic to your own web server. Uh, so so your code continues to run fine, right? Uh, brilliant in concept, but then uh, we we quickly find out that there are problems. So the way it works is that on the client side, there's no other way to do this, it has to be done from the client side if you think about it, is that on the client side, they introduce a script loader for you. So they ask you to load this JS file, uh, and what this JS file does is, oh, oh okay, all right. Sure, sure. Right, so it adds a script loader, and what the script loader does is that when there is, So the script loader, what it does is that it, it tries to connect to the proxy, and it, if the proxy can give code down to the user, then that's great, and uh, uh, everything works as usual. If the proxy cannot, if, if the code cannot connect, if the client cannot connect to the proxy, then it will now try to connect to your web server. So it tries to connect to the proxy, discovers the proxy is down, uh, and cannot get code from the proxy, then it sort of routes the traffic to your, your web server instead. So that's how it works. I, I call that proxy with a failover. I don't have a better name for it, but you know, whatever. Uh, reliability obviously improves because now you are not dependent on that proxy being up. Your your app can take care of the load as well. Uh, but performance obviously deteriorates. And that's because, uh, you know, for two reasons. Number one is the worst case scenario is when their proxy is down. Uh, you have to connect to that proxy first to discover that it is down. There is, you know, no other way you can do it. And only after you discover that it is down, you're going to be connecting to your web server, which is at least one network request extra that you have to make, uh, just so that you can, your app can even get bootstrapped, right? Uh, the other reason, which is the far worse reason, is that you are now forced to use a script loader, uh, which is a blocking network request for all of your users at all times. You know, you, there's no other solution. So uh, performance is definitely going to go down because of this. Uh, yeah, so it needs a script loader, and, and that is at least its own additional network request. Uh, so I'm going to give performance a bad score over here for sure. There is no way we can fix performance. But reliability has fixed itself, so you know that's a good thing. Um, otherwise, anything else is fine. Uh, moving on, uh, and there are companies that do this as well, where what they do is that you add that script tag to your page, and then they will start playing with your browser methods itself. So rather than adding try cache to your code, they will add try cache to your runtime. So you know, like for I'll, I'll show you a quick example. Uh, and this is a very simplified implementation here. 
Uh, I hope the code is available, is, is visible behind you. But what it does is that, for example, I'm just taking one function over here called document.addEventListener, right, which is very familiar to everyone. Uh, and I'm caching that into a, into a variable here. And I'm creating my own document.addEventListener now, which overrides the original document.addEventListener. Where what I'm doing is that I'm basically calling the old document.addEventListener, except that the handler has now got a try catch around it. Right? And within the try block, I'm calling the handler that was passed in. So I'm retaining the same signature as, as the original document.addEventListener. But uh, this is my code now, this is not the browser's code. Uh, and I have added a try catch around every handler that's being passed in. Right? Any questions? Is, is this clear? Any questions about this? It's a little complex if you are not used to this. Can you do the same thing to set timeout? Sorry? Can you do the same thing to set timeout? To set timeout, so you can do this to a bunch of things. You can do this to, uh, yeah, you can do this to native events. You can do this to set timeout. There are things that you can't do this to. You can't do this to, uh, say, AJAX calls, right? Because you got ready state changing over time and stuff. So you can't do this to AJAX calls. Uh, but, but yeah, there are a couple of things that you can do this to. Um, so, so yeah, this, this is one more approach that people are doing now. This is a very simplified implementation, mind you. Go ahead. Uh, so, will these try catch blocks will uh, be applied to uh, any inner functions or closures? Those won't get uh, this try catch block. Yeah, you're right. So, so inner functions will not have this unless your inner functions are using DOM methods to become asynchronous. Uh, in the sense of you know, like like the example that I showed you, where where there was the jQuery example of button click and all that, that will work fine in this example because. You're using browser methods to uh, to do your async operations. No, no, uh, yeah, entire code is sitting so on node will definitely be wrapped, but then you would also need to wrap uh, <laughs> Yeah, so on node will definitely be wrapped, but you will also need to wrap things that are happening inside of onload. So you might be setting up events inside of onload and so on and so forth, right? So you need to wrap those as well internally. But, but yeah, largely this works. Now, uh, uh, this is a very, like I said, this is a very simplified implementation. I'm only overriding one event over here, which is document.addEventListener. It's operating on only one object, which is a document object. Uh, you will have to do this for every single node. You will have to do this for things like set timeout and set interval. Uh, you will have to do this all over the place. Now, you would think that this is, this is easy to do. You know, I can just play with prototypes of, of commonly known objects like node or element or whatever. Turns out you can't play with prototypes of native objects in Internet Explorer and older versions. So there are other hacks you have to do where you have to keep watching the DOM and every time there's a DOM change, figure out which was the delta that changed and then to that you have to add methods. So this is painful, right? It's very, very difficult. Um, so here's the scorecard. Performance I'm going to say is bad. And the reason I'm going to say performance is bad is not because there's a lot to be done. But you know I'm going to assume that that is fast because engines are fast. But I'm going to say performance is bad because you have to do this before the rest of your code runs, right? So you have to do this before any of your before your app actually starts. So uh, let's keep this up. I just switched the slide. Is there something? Can you just tell me what has to be done? Yeah. <coughs> Um, so, so I'm going to say performance is bad because you have to do all of this stuff before uh, the, the page loads. So, so that's going to be a network request that you're going to send out from your machine, uh, from the user's box that is going to do all of this stuff first to your page and only then can the rest of your app uh, start loading. I mean if you already attached events and so on beforehand, uh, you cannot add try catch, try catch blocks to them once they have already been added, right? You have to do it before everything starts. So, so uh, uh, that's why I'm going to say that this bad performance. Uh, the last method here is window dot on error, um, and what window dot on error? The way it works is that it's it's basically an event like window dot on load or whatever. You can assign uh, a listener to it. Uh, it gets three parameters: message, line number, and file. Uh, the line number and file is the file, the line number in that file at which the error occurred, and gives you a message. Uh, now, honestly, this suddenly looks very beautiful to me because uh, every time, so every time an error occurs, this thing gets fired, and you can you can now catch the error over here. Right? Uh, this looks beautiful because this is not mucking with your code. This is not mucking with your runtime. You know, this is not doing any of that fancy stuff. 
uh, is, is sitting by itself in one corner completely externally. Uh, so so I, I like this approach a lot. Uh, the downsides are that you do not have access to an error object because all you get is these three parameters, so you don't have error objects with you. Uh, so errors necessarily can't be rich. You can't get stack traces, for example, right? Another problem is that by the time this window dot on error has been called, the stack has already unrolled. Uh, so even if you don't explicitly get a stack trace, you cannot manually walk your call stack and try to build your stack trace yourself because the stack is not available, it is already unrolled, right? Uh, as a pro though, it is dead simple to implement. This just, you know, th that's all the code that you have to write and you get, you get errors by yourself, right? Um, so here's the scorecard, performance again depends. Reliability and effort have gone up. Uh, so after the build system based thing that we were talking about, this is really the best looking system over here. Uh, so, so while building interception, I decided, I, I decided to give a hard look at this and see if I could package this into a nice thing and you know make this make this uh, 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 worthy enough of consideration and you know uh, make this into a service that's easy to use. Uh, and I was fortunately able to do just that. Uh, but before that, here's yet next code plan. Right? So. Uh, this is, this is how everything looks so far. Uh, as you can see, in these top three rows, uh, only the build system and the window.on error has got green marks, whereas everything else has got a red somewhere or the other within the top three. Uh, so, so that's basically it. You either implement your own build system or you use window.on error to get the benefits of performance and reliability and, and maintaining low effort without time, right? Uh, now, now, obviously, over here. Uh, so, post error, right? This, this is something that we have constantly avoided, uh, and I said I'll come back to this. <coughs> so, how do you make post error available in your page uh, in a fashion that does not block your page load? Was one of the challenges that I wanted to fix. And though I talked about this in detail in a previous talk that had to do with with uh, uh, third-party JavaScript, but this is basically what I'm doing is that I've got an array and every time an error occurs, I'm pushing data into that array, right? This is the snippet that I give you. The, so when you log into Errorception, you create an account, your snippet is basically doing this. It's an array into which I'm pushing data as and when I get errors. Meanwhile, at a later time, in fact, so late as after page load, I am loading the code to process this array and then post that data to the server, right? So, so now the benefit is that I can do this in line. So this is the snippet that I give you. You copy paste this onto your page, and there is absolutely no performance hit that you will get because of this. Because all I'm doing is populating an array. There's nothing else I'm doing locally on your on, on the user's machine. Meanwhile, parallelly, in fact, I do it later, so late in the page load cycle, that your code is not going to get affected at all. Your resources will continue to load as normal. I will then load the code up that is going to process this array. Right? And so there is no load time performance hit. And you also don't take a hard dependency. In case my code does not load for whatever reason, the worst that happens is you've got an array that's populated, right? That's not flush. That's the worst that happens. It does not get worse than that. So it's highly, highly reliable uh, because of that. So, so that's an exception for you. It's high performance by design. It's highly reliable by design for the reasons that I just explained. Uh, it catches all errors. So, so the coverage here is the best because it catches errors that happen inside on-click handlers. It catches errors that happen in inline JavaScript that sits inside your HTML. It's crazy. The kind of coverage that this gets is crazy. It catches errors that happen inside ad networks. It catches errors. Did you know that Google bot executes your JavaScript? I can show you I can show you errors that I've caught from Google bot. It's freaking crazy, right? So it catches all kinds of errors. Right? As a as a as a con, there are no stack traces that are available, uh, you know, because of the approaches that I told you. I cannot get stack traces over here. Except in IE. Now, IE is a funky case where I'm able to build a pseudo stack trace by walking the call stack. Because when window.com is called, uh, the, the stack is actually not unrolled in IE, which is very interesting. So all of a sudden, now I have possibilities over there. So I can now walk the call stack, and I can you know find out which were the functions called and so on. So I do that in the case of IE. So you have stack traces in IE. Uh, you know, I'm slowly, if you notice, I'm slowly moving towards a product pitch, but you know, I'm doing that. So other features are that uh, decent duplicate, the uh, uh, duplication detection, which is, you know, you get, uh, you have a million users using your site. You can, I cannot give you a, you know, these are the million errors that you've got, right? You're going to say, what the hell, I'm going to, you know. So, so I, I need to sort of make that into a smaller list, right? So I do that by, by detecting duplicates very well. So I say that the error has happened in Chrome 16 and 17 and 14 and 13, right? 
this is the one error, it has occurred seven times, you know, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and yeah, it goes on to add a bunch of metrics about errors. I'll show you a quick screenshot of that, which is very interesting. And it reads out errors that you don't care about. So, for example, if Google Analytics broke, you probably don't care about it. It just catches errors in Google Analytics, man. It's crazy. Uh, you know, and if, for example, if Facebook did not, uh, your Facebook widget did not load or the like button, uh, you know, uh, did not work, uh, you probably don't care about that. So, errors like that are muted out. A little bit of marketing talks, just one quick slide, then I'll be done. Uh, is that it's being used by several big internet brands. Uh, I unfortunately don't have the liberty of naming them, but trust me on this, it's, uh, big internet brands that are using this. Five million errors so far. Uh, it's only been in existence for about four months now, but five million errors so far. Uh, these are internet brands, right? The internet, their website is what they care about, and their website is their product, and there are five million errors that have caught over there. So, you know, you can imagine the scale of this. Uh, as much as I've said that reliability is not a problem, you know, I've never had a long time so far. Uh, so sign up, the slide is old, it's not in closed beta anymore, it's free, uh, uh, the trial is free, so you know, give it a spin, tell me what you think. Uh, quick set of screenshots of the app. Uh, I've hidden away some details so that you don't see, uh, you know, so that you know, people are not implicated. Um, and this is what an error report looks like. It's got a bunch of details about which which error, which browser it happened in, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's it. Uh, it's built for those who are interested. It's built with Node and Mongo, so you know, uh, it's JavaScript stack. My my shell scripts are in Node. I'm, you know, I, I, I love that word. Um, so give it a spin. Errorception.com. At errorception is a Twitter handle. Uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for tolerating this. Questions, yeah. uh, what's the performance gap with Windows on as a user? The performance cost of Windows on Windows 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 What's the browser support for window.on error? Oh, great question. Yeah. Sorry, I'm better than that. Um, so, browser support for window.on error is, is not as good as the browser support for try catch blocks. Um, so, for example, so all your popular browsers are supported. So, your Firefox, your yeah, yeah, IE, your Chrome. Opera, the latest version of Opera now supports uh, try catch blocks. Uh, older versions did not support. error is not supporting, I guess. Window.on error. No, window.on error is there in the latest versions of Opera. It is not there in older versions, you're right. Uh, mobile browsers did not support this until iOS 5 being the first uh, mobile environment that supports uh, Windows Runner. So in your iPads and your iPhones now you can catch errors uh, with Windows Runner. Uh, but, but yeah, there are older browsers in which it does not work. So Firefox 2 and older it's not supported. Interestingly all of IE is supported. IE is the one who pioneered Windows Runner. So it's, it's supported in all of IE. Uh, it's not supported in older versions of Chrome. I think Chrome 11 and before is not supported, but Chrome is not so much of an issue because people keep upgrading quickly. Uh, so yeah, so most most popular environments are supported. There might be esoteric browsers that are not supporting Windows Do you do something for browsers that are not supported? Not at the moment, no. Uh, but I have plans coming up very quickly to, to fix that. There are a couple of ideas that I have. To because I still say, think the proxy approach is not that bad if you do proper network rerouting and balancing. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. But then you, there is there is a performance cost that comes. Yeah. Uh, but you can you could do that as a in case it doesn't. Work. Right. 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 I, I yeah. In any case, I do plan to incorporate uh, uh, mechanisms for browsers that don't support. Uh, Okay, could you repeat his question? Sometimes? Yeah, his question was uh, that what what about browsers that do not support Windows on error? Will it be uh, will it not work in, in those browsers, or are there any other mechanisms available for them? So interception currently doesn't, but I have plans to do that. So about having uh, <coughs> these uh, errors, uh, when adding uh, try catches to DOM methods, right? I don't understand the performance cost. So. Uh, the question was adding uh, try catches uh, to DOM elements. What is the performance cost? The the performance cost is not the runtime performance cost. The performance cost is that this has to be done beforehand, and hence requires you to introduce a script tag that's going to do this. Now, uh, if you look at people who have built code that is already doing this, the code size is somewhere in the region of 50k, which is which is like you know 33, 66 percent larger than jQuery is. You know, it's it's very big. 
so you have to download that code from your server and you do that in a blocking fashion because you necessarily have to do that before all of your other code runs. So that is the performance cost over there. Any other questions? Cool, thanks. Thanks a lot. If you have any questions, feel free to Thanks, Rakesh.